All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Owens. Um, I study chemical physics for General Electric research, mainly focused on materials development for carbon capture. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about less results and more the problem we're trying to solve and how NERSC has enabled us to uh, make progress toward that goal. When you think about capturing CO2, typically the, it's divided into two classes. Um, one is post-combustion capture, which as it sounds, you put some sort of material on a power plant or in a coal flue or something like that and, and stop the CO2 from ever entering the air. And then the other is direct air capture, which is the removal of historical CO2 emissions. So you just like put it out in some area and let it just scrub the atmosphere. And the reason that there's a kind of distinction between these two things is because there's very different concentrations of CO2 in those different applications. So like post-combustion has 4% CO2 and direct air capture has 400 parts per million CO2. So it's pretty well thought that something that's good for one may not be good for the other. Now, that said, there is a general class of materials that the community has sort of converged upon as being the most promising for CO2 capture, and that does span post-combustion and direct air. Um, and these are, these are called metal organic frameworks. Um, they are pretty much what the name says. They are these three-dimensional, very porous materials that, are consist, that consist of metal nodes connected by organic linkers. Um, you change the node, you change the linker, you change its properties. Um, over 90,000 have been synthesized and 500,000 have been theorized. Obviously not all of these will be good for carbon capture. Um, there are other applications too, batteries, drug delivery, things like that. So it's a, it's a material search problem. And then to complicate it even further, because I guess that's what we like to do, you can also put small molecules inside the pore, uh, functional groups or amines. And what this does is it typically changes how the CO2 is absorbed by your material from like a physical van der Waals effect to a chemical bond. The benefit of that is that uh, if it's a chemical bond, you know, not every gas is going to um, be able to bond to the material. Whereas if it's a van der Waals interaction, most gases will, will bond. So if, if you have something like atmospheric air, which has CO2, but a lot of other stuff, and you, you really just want the CO2. Uh, when we think about a good material, and this is both experimentally and computationally, we want something that is stable, uh, stable to thermal fluctuations. Um, water doesn't degrade it, and, and you don't have problems with uh, oxidation. Uh, it needs to have high capacity. It needs to be able to for its mass hold a lot of CO2. And it needs to absorb that quickly. You know, you can't just wait hours and hours for the material to fill up before you flush it out. And then it also needs to be robust to humidity, especially in the atmosphere, because there's always water in the atmosphere. Um, it, as far as calculations we do, uh, really the, the first thing we think about for stability um, from first principles uh, are kind of uh, two steps, right? We, we have the first one where, you know, we start with some hypothetical molecule and put it in some given MOF framework or structure. And the first thing we ask is how many of those little molecules can fit in the pore? The reason you care about that is because the molecule, the number of molecules basically determines the number of sites you can absorb CO2 on. So in principle, you know, the more molecules, the more CO2 you can absorb in a given uh, volume. And we also care about the formation energy of those molecules when the structure is being created. And that's just because um, in general, we think a, a structure with a better formation energy will be more stable in terms, especially of like thermal uh, degradation. So once we kind of, you know, you can put these molecules in the pore a bunch of different ways, like you know, sometimes you can have one molecule and you can draw it for different loadings and different geometries, maybe like seven or eight ways. So once we identify the ones that seem the most energetically favorable, then we do um, ab initio molecular dynamics. So, you know, we, we crank the thermostat and we, we see which configuration is 
probably stable and less likely to fall apart. Um, and that generally actually does correspond to formation energy as you would expect, but, but not always. And then the other big thing is capacity, right? So capacity is um, how much CO2 can the material hold and, and what's the maximum upper limit. Um, so there's this theoretical chemisorption capacity, which is really, like I said, governed by how many adsorption sites you have within your material. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's how much CO2 you will actually grab at a given um, DAC or PCC condition. And to kind of understand that, if you look at this plot here, these are isotherms. Um, and what they do is basically they relate the pressure to the amount of CO2 your material absorbs. And these are for different temperatures. But one thing you'll notice is that the higher pressure, the higher uptake you have, which makes sense. Um, but you know some materials will be better at lower pressures than others. Uh, and then the other kind of thing to note about uptake is that it, it has some functional form. You can tell it's sort of logarithmic, um, and it depends on your Gibbs free energy, right, which is a thermodynamic quantity, which in turn depends on your entropy and your enthalpy um, and your binding energy. So to calculate these sort of things from first principles, we need to do phonon calculations. Um, and then also like structural relaxations with and without CO2. So, you know, for a given configuration, um, you, you actually, to fully characterize it, you spend a lot of compute time doing it. So, you know, in that way, then we, we asked, like, how has NERSC enabled us to, to do this, and, and Perlmutter in particular? Uh, and one of the things is just having NVIDIA GPUs has been great because we use Quantum Espresso. And um, while the latest version is, I guess, a little more compatible with OpenACC, when we started doing this, there was very little support for non CUDA. Um, so that was great because I know Frontier, you know, they moved to something else. And so, you know, when we considered that one, it was um, not really feasible. And the other thing is actually the queuing policies, which is funny because I heard people talk about them being too short. Uh, but for us, they're great, right? Because um, we're typically operating on a few hundred atoms. And, you know, our, our optimal number of nodes is somewhere between 16 and, and 32. Um, on Summit, you need, say, 42 nodes before they'll even let you run for six hours, right? So um, this, you know, we can do 16 or 8 or whatever, and we can run now up to 24, which is about all we need to, to complete the calculation. Whereas with Summit, I've babysat and restarted, you know, two hours, two hours, two hours, multiple times, um, which is painful. And it, and it really slows down the progress, not just from a calculation speed time, but also you know, I can't always restart every two hours. Um, so, so for us, it's, it's been a game changer for that. Um, and then, you know, the super facility API has helped with organization. So when you're, you're running all these different calculations and different um, characterization techniques, you, there's a lot of bookkeeping for different configurations for different materials. And the, the super facility API lets us kind of embed this into a Python script and automate the workflow. And so kind of move from a bunch of Excel spreadsheets to um, a dashboard. So our, our team has developed like an internal tool that wraps um, the different leadership computing facilities sites and, and allows you to you know, post jobs. And then there's also a GUI for tracking the runs. Now, ironically, when I pulled the screen cap, um, it was broken, so there are no jobs showing here. But that is generally not the case. Um, that that you know I can kind of keep track of everything that's that's running on there. Uh, so that's very useful. Um, so you know, from from what we've done in in numbers, we we want an ALCC to do this, and that started in July 2023. Um, and since then, we've performed you know 86 like detailed, thorough computational studies for different material configurations spanning 27 unique materials, which I know compared to like the thousands and millions that a lot of people look at is not that much. But, you know, again, like each one of these is, um, there's not really a good way to auto generate them. You know, there's a lot of manual intervention. And we also, because we're trying to build up understanding, we care a lot about every aspect of the materials performance. 
and hopefully over time we'll be able to speed this up with like uh, data analysis. But um, you know that's uh, it's it's quite a lot. You know, experimentally over two years we maybe looked at 200, and that's with you know 15 experimentalists. Whereas there's two of us computational guys, so we're you know we're catching up. We we want to pull ahead. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, thanks to GE for funding it. Um, there's over 50 of us at, at GE working on this. Um, the ALCC program, ironically, I did not put NERSC in here, which is wild, um, but also NERSC. I did put, I did put Perlmutter. Um, and then we, we've also, you know, we've burned cycles at uh, Argonne on Polaris and uh, Summit on Oak Ridge. And then, of course, Quantum Espresso, which is uh, fully GPU enabled now with the latest release, which is great. So happy to answer any questions.